Hello and welcome back to Introduction to the Philosophy of Religion. So in this segment we'll look at the concept of God in Africa, or rather in the traditional religions of two different peoples of Africa, namely the Akan and the Shona. The Akan live in Ghana and the Ivory Coast on the eastern side of the continent, while the Shona are concentrated in Zimbabwe in the south. There are in fact more than a thousand peoples or tribes in the continent of Africa and each has their own traditional religion. And in many cases the similarities outweigh the differences. Though this doesn't mean we should treat all these religions as identical because doctrines and practices do differ across the various peoples. In this segment we'll take a closer look at the Akan and Shona conceptions of God. It's quite easy to find scholars, even those from the Akan and Shona peoples, describing God in ways that will be very familiar to us. So for example, a prominent Akan philosopher tells us that Onyami, the supreme being of the Akan, is not only omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent, but also the absolute reality, the origin of all things, the absolute ground, the sole and whole explanation of the universe and the source of all existence. And in a recent book, a Shauna thinker explains that Mwari, the Shauna god, is believed to be omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, holy, just, loving and merciful. And statements like these give the impression that the concept of God in Africa is the same as the traditional concept of God in the West, namely the God of the philosophers. But this has not gone unnoticed or unchallenged. So according to one African scholar, Pibitek, he says, when students of African religions describe African deities as eternal, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, and so on, they intimate that African deities have identical attributes with those of the Christian God. But this, he says, is absurd and misleading. Bitek claims that descriptions of God as omnipotent, omniscient and so on are not found in the traditional religions of Africa at all. And they are, in fact, the result of importing Western ideas into African religions. So what is being described is, in fact, the Christian God, or rather, the God of the philosophers, but under an African name. So Bitek points out that in African religions, God is traditionally described as strong, wise, old and great, rather than by Western philosophical terms like omnipotent, omniscient, eternal and omnipresent. So what's happened here? Well, this is the story. As you probably know, almost all of the continent of Africa was colonised by various European powers between 1884 and 1914. That's a period known as the Scramble for Africa. And the graphic on the screen shows which European powers seized control of which African territories. Now the reasons behind the colonisation of Africa are complex and we don't need to get into them here. For our purposes, it's enough to know that in taking over these territories, the European powers took the valuable natural resources for themselves, while European missionaries took the opportunity to promote Christianity throughout the continent. Previous Christian missions to Africa had not made much impact, but during colonial rule of Africa, they were much more successful, and they often had European state support. As a result, today, Huge swathes of Africa identify as Christian. However, many African converts to Christianity also retained some or all of their traditional religious beliefs and practices, such that many Africans have what has been described as dual membership, whereby they belong both to Christianity and to their traditional religion. So how do we get to the point where the gods of different African religions were described in exactly the same way as the Western god of the philosophers? Well, this is how. The first colonists and missionaries from Europe arrived in the 1880s, 
and they were steeped in Christianity and European ways of living and thought that these were the height of civilization. So when these colonists and missionaries arrived in Africa, they were dismayed at what they saw or what they thought they saw. With their dismal grasp of the, Af dismal grasp of the African traditional religions, they thought that Africans worshipped ancestors and sticks and stones. Some of them figured that the concept of God must be too abstract for African minds and that therefore Africans had no concept of God and no proper religion. Others did accept that Africans had a concept of God and a religion, but they reckoned that these religions were inferior to Christianity. Either way, the colonists and missionaries looked upon Africans as backward, primal, primitive and savage in virtually every, every sphere of life, religion included. And so they took it upon themselves to civilize Africa, as they say, by introducing Christianity and other Western ideas. So early on, colonists and missionaries sought to convince Africans to abandon their traditional religions and convert to the supposedly superior Christian religion. And then, at the end of the 19th century, an amateur anthropologist put forward a theory that every human being possessed a sense of the supreme being, which the supreme being had given everyone in order to prepare the way for the reception of Christianity by all peoples. And this theory quickly became very popular among anthropologists and missionaries, who started to look a little bit more deeply into the traditional beliefs of African peoples and they ended up finding evidence of widespread belief in a supreme being. So the anthropologists and missionaries then produced a flurry of books claiming to show that such and such a people or tribe did indeed have the notion of a supreme being. Many went further and claimed that the notion of the god of this or that African tribe was essentially the same as the notion of god that Western Christians believed in. What the anthropologists and missionaries did, essentially, was draw a box, put their own concept of God inside, and then write the name of various African gods on the side of the box, as if to say that the African gods were merely different labels for the Christian God, or the God of the philosophers. And unfortunately, in doing this, they westernized African gods and African religions. And this is the source of Pitek's complaint about the westernization of African deities that we saw earlier. Now, as already noted, there are more than 1,000 peoples or tribes in the continent of Africa. Each has their own traditional religion, but none of them has any written sacred text. So no equivalent of the Quran or the Bible or anything like that. In Africa before colonialism, Ideas were transmitted orally, handed down within the family and other members of the tribal groups. So where does our written information about African religions come from? Well, there are five main sources. First of all, we have white colonists and missionaries who thought Africans either did not have a concept of God or had only an inferior one to Christianity, and that's usually from the late 19th century. Another source are uh, white colonists and missionaries who thought Africans did have a concept of God that was more or less equivalent to that of Christianity. And that comes from around the early to the mid part of the 20th century. And our third source of information comes from black Africans who agreed that Africans did have a concept of God that was more or less equivalent to that of Christianity. And that's from around the 1950s onwards. Our fourth source are black Africans who wanted to recover the traditional beliefs by stripping away the Western Christian philosophical elements that had been added since colonization. And again, that's from around the 1950s onwards. And our final source of information comes from white anthropologists and experts in religion who also wanted to recover the traditional beliefs by stripping away the Western Christian philosophical elements that had been added because of uh, colonization and that's around from the 1970s onwards. So it's the writings of these five groups 
That's what we have to work with. When you're reading philosophical works, it's generally a good idea not just to understand the words on the page, but also to understand who wrote them and why. And this can sometimes tell you more than the words on the page can. And this approach is definitely worth taking when reading works on African philosophy, because different kinds of people have written about it and they have had different reasons for doing so. Or perhaps it's better to say they have had different agendas for doing so. And these different people, with their different agendas, can lead to them saying very different things, as we will see. But unfortunately, we can't simply focus on those writers who want to present the authentic, pre-colonial African voice on God and religion. Because sometimes the writings by early colonists and missionaries contain information that cannot be found anywhere else. Now you might be wondering, if African religions don't have any sacred texts, how do we find out about their notions of God? Well, the best way is usually to focus on the name of their God, and also on the various praise names. And by that I mean the ceremonial names or titles given to their God. And there are usually quite a few praise names, as we'll see. And these provide an insight into how God is conceived. So let's turn to the religion of the Shona peoples from modern day Zimbabwe. I mentioned at the very end of the last segment that the god of the Shona peoples is called Mwari. What does this mean? Well, one theory says that the word Mwari is formed from two Shona words, Mu and Ari, meaning the one who and is, to make the one who is. That's what they say it means. And if you're thinking that this is identical to the meaning of the Jewish and Christian god Yahweh, you'd be right. And there's a very good reason for this. The theory of the origin of the name Mwari was devised in 1984 by a Christian missionary working on a Shona translation of the Christian Bible. Of course, by suggesting that both Mwari and Yahweh meant the same thing, the missionary was able to identify the Shona God with the God of the Bible, the Christian Bible and so treat them as one and the same. But as other people have noted, this looks like an attempt to Christianize the Shauna God. Or perhaps we could say it's an attempt to Shaunaize the Christian God, to make the Christian God more acceptable to the Shauna people. The missionary's theory has proved very popular to some Christians in Zimbabwe who use it to make the point that the Shona God and the Christian God are one and the same being. But despite this, the missionary's theory about the meaning of Mwari's name is almost certainly false. The Shona themselves claim that the name has been used for God since time immemorial. And researchers have found that the name Mwari has been used by the Shona for anything between a thousand to three thousand years. And that's going to rule out any influence from Christianity regarding the name. So instead, Mwari appears to be just a personal name. Let's now consider some of Mwari's praise names and see what we can draw out from those. So there's a lot of information laid out on the screen there. Now the first list of English translations, that's in the second column, they all come from one particular author who is a Zimbabwean scholar in religion. The second list of English translations come from various other authors, they're just from all over. Though you'll find that the two lists do overlap to a large extent. There are a few discrepancies in there. One concerns Muziki and Muzika Vanhu, and whether these mean creator or maker. In fact they mean maker, but we'll worry about that when we look at the doctrine of creation in week three. Now from the praise names, hopefully we can start to see what, what Bitek meant when he said that in African religions God is traditionally described as strong, wise, old and great. 
rather than in Western philosophical terms like omnipotent, omniscient, eternal and omnipresent. So we're seeing God there described as maker, lord, possessor, moulder of things, one who existed at the beginning, that kind of thing. So from the praise names we can infer that Moari is thought to be self-existent or uncreated, unborn, maker and designer of the universe and everything in it, above all humans and nature, creator of good and evil, the source of life, powerful or even all-powerful, sovereign and eternal. And on the basis of this list, it looks as though there are important ways in which the Shauna notion of God differs from the traditional notion in the West, the God of the philosophers. Because obviously there's no mention here of omnipotence, omniscience and perfect goodness, nor is there any hint at all of Moari being thought of as timeless, unchanging or infinite. And that isn't to say that Moari isn't thought of in these ways, only that we cannot infer it from the praise names. However, we can surely infer that Moari has a lot of knowledge or wisdom, as that would surely be needed to make or design the universe and everything in it. And on top of that, there's evidence from elsewhere that Moari is conceived as an unembodied spirit, as invisible and as one. But you might be thinking, well, as impressive a set of attributes as Moari is thought to have, they still differ in important ways from those associated with the traditional notion of God in the West. And if you are thinking this, I would make two observations. First, I would say, we could actually say that the notion of God we can derive from the Jewish, Christian and Islamic scriptures also differs in important ways from the traditional notion of God in the West. And we saw that in the last segment. And the second point I would make is that there might be advantages of not being conceived in the same way as the traditional notion of God in the West. And this is something I'm going to ask you to consider in one of this week's tasks. Okay, let's turn now to the God of the Akan people. I've mentioned before, the name of this God is Onyami, or sometimes Nyami. What does this mean? Well, Onyami has been taken to mean different things by different scholars. Some say it means the Shining One. Others say it means Sky, or Sky God. And yet others say that it means Absolute Satisfier. Given how the Akan conceive of Onyami, I'd be inclined to think the last of these suggestions, Absolute Satisfier, is the most plausible, but we'll come back to this in a few minutes. For now, let's consider the different praise names the Akan use for Onyami. Now, if you look at the first list of Onyami's uh, praise names, so the second column there, the first list of English translations, it looks very much as though what is being described is the Western god of the philosophers. We see Onyami attributed with omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence. It also looks as though Onyami is the uncreated creator, infinite and eternal. And such a description is reminiscent of how Jews, Christians and Muslims describe their God. Is this a coincidence? Might the Akan notion of God have been influenced by outside forces, such as the Christians and Muslims with whom the Akan have been in contact since the 15th century? Or did the Akan arrive at this notion of God independently? Well, perhaps a better question to ask would be, is this a genuine reflection of the Akan idea of God at all? And quite possibly it isn't. Although this first list comes from a scholar called Kwame Jekye, who is a philosopher from the Akan people, he is sometimes criticised for viewing Akan ideas from a Western perspective, such that he sometimes smuggles in Western terms and ideas that are actually not found in Akan thinking at all. So perhaps we ought to see if others construe the praise names in a different way. And as it happens, they do. So if you look at the second list of the English translation of 
on Yami's praise name, that's the third column in the table, you'll see a very different account. Now the translations in this second list come from a variety of different sources. In this second list, we see that Onyami is powerful, wise, and a maker. But there's no hint now of omnipotence, omniscience, and so on. But from this second list, we can also infer that Onyami is one, uncreated, and perhaps omnipresent as well. And we can flesh this characterization out a bit further by looking at other sources. For example, another Af uh, Akan philosopher claims that Onyami is eternal, at least in the sense that he's always existed and always will exist, but not in the sense of being timeless, so not outside of time. And I think this list, certainly the, the second list of English translations, will help us to understand better Onyami's name. So we saw a few minutes ago, there were various suggestions as to the meaning of Onyami. We had the Shining One, Sky, Sky God, and Absolute Satisfier. So if we look at the list of praise names and what they tell us about how Onyami is conceived, it's difficult to think of Onyami as the Shining One, or the Sky, or a Sky God. There's nothing in that list to suggest that. But given Onyami's description as dependable, or the one on whom you can lean without falling, I think it would be plausible to think of Onyami as absolute satisfier. Okay, let's round up. In this segment, we've looked at the notion of God in two different African religions, that of the Shona and the Akan. We looked at the names of God in these religions and also the praise names, and we tried to deduce from those the attributes God is thought to have. But one thing we haven't considered yet is God's gender. But this will be the subject of the next segment.